I think it's probably appropriate that we're having the meeting today because I think this is probably one of the hardest days I think of my life. I suspect it's going to be the hardest day in the life of the Syrian revolution. Today we heard that the uh, defenders of Baba Amr, the neighbourhood of Homs, had to abandon the neighbourhood and Syrian troops are now moving in and probably what's going on reports of what I saw before I came out is that all men over the age of 13 are being rounded up and there seems to be some kind of massacre taking place. So I think this is, you know, I think it's, it's going to be quite hard, I think, um, I think quite hard for me, but I think it's going to be quite hard for us to kind of keep sort of the emotion on the check and try and look clearly at actually what is quite a complicated and difficult uh, problem. I want to start by saying that the Syrian revolution is a real revolution. And in fact, I think it was Trotsky who said, a popular uprising of the people needs no justification. I think the Syrian uprising needs no justification. It is an uprising of a people long repressed, you know, under difficult circumstances. Um, the uh, regime attack on, on Homs and on Baba Amr uh, neighborhood specifically is an attempt by the regime, I think, to crush what they call the capital of the revolution. The center of gravity, I think, for the Syrian resistance and for the Syrian people. And it seems by all accounts they succeeded today. The, the assault on Babel Amr has come at the same time as an assault on the working class, armed assault on the working class districts of Aleppo, uh, the second city of Syria and the biggest city in, 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 in the region, an attack on Idlib in the north, an attack on Hamma, uh, another important uh, Syrian city. So this is part of a general offensive a murderous yeah. attempt to destroy a real revolution. I think that's where we have to start from. There is, I think when people look into Syria to try and understand uh, where this revolution came from, of course the immediate trigger was the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak before him Ben Ali of, of Tunisia, Hosni Mubarak of Egypt. This uh, broke, if you like, that uh, atmosphere of fear, atmosphere of fatalism, which everyone in the Middle East grew up uh, you know, grew up with over the last few years. Uh, just to kind of put it in perspective, uh, the uh, Syrian regime imposed a state of emergency three months before I was born, in 1963, just to give you an idea of how long uh, this has been. The nature of the revolution itself, and we look into the revolution, is full of problems, and I want to talk a little bit about that. But I also want to talk about the nature of the regime and its contradictory uh, position inside of the Middle East. Um, I also want to talk about uh, what future and what direction we think, or we hope, uh, the revolution will take and how it can succeed. I just want to start with the roots of the revolution itself. When people say, and there's a lot of this around, which I think actually is almost beneath contempt, the idea that somehow the Syrian revolution is some kind of plot, uh, cooked up in Washington or in Tel Aviv or in Riyadh or, 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 or wherever, that the Syrian people are simply pawns in strategic manoeuvres by imperialism inside of the Middle East. It's not that at all. This is a real revolution. The people might have heard early on in the Tunisian, the Egyptian revolution, the slogan, the people demand the overthrow of the regime. This was not the slogan in the first days of the Syrian revolution. The slogan in the first days of the Syrian revolution was the people demand the implementation of reforms. Bashar al-Assad, who took over from his father in 2000, uh, Hafez al-Assad, uh, attempted to uh, initiate what is now known as the Damascus Spring. It lasted 18 months. The Damascus, the Damascus Spring had two elements to it. The first element was dismantling of the uh, you know, state capitalist economy or social economy, however you want to call it, uh, to, you know, introduction of neoliberalism, to sign up Syria to something called the Euromed Agreement, which tied in the Middle East, uh, especially in the Mediterranean area, to the European Union. This was the economic uh, drive, the economic reforms introduced by uh, Bashar al-Assad. It took forms I think we're probably all very well aware of. Uh, mass privatization, cutting of subsidies on bread and fuel, and so on. The second part of the Damascus Spring was the so-called political reforms. And in order to release, if you like, some of the tension inside society, especially built up under the regime of Hafs al-Assad, Bashar's father, was an attempt, if you like, to set boundaries towards what will be acceptable uh, opposition, an op acceptable opposition movement. And they call it the Salon uh, Reformists. The Salon people would come and sit in front rooms and discuss within a limited fashion how they feel the, 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 Syrian, uh, the, the Syrian regime will change. This economic reforms moved at a pace. 
the privatization, the private banks, and so on. This happened very, 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 very quickly and with very little problems. The political reforms stopped after 18 months. And I remember I was, I was working in Beirut at the time. Everyone was talking about the Syrian spring. And then suddenly the salons were closed down. Uh, apparently, the conversations turned from within the acceptable boundaries of, of, uh, of, of the regime to beginning to, to, to deal with some of the wider issues, notably corruption, uh, the disappearances, the political prisoners, and so on. At this point, the hardliners, very much was in, inside the Syrian regime, moved and moved to close them down. They jailed MPs, and those involved, the leading figures inside the Salon movement, were given jail sentences between five and seven years. It was, if you like, the closing down of the, of the, the political reform, at the same time the opening up and uh, acceleration of the economic reform. So you had, if you like, uh, a real kind of neoliberalism with very little on top, uh, but very little political reform going, uh, go, going with it. The, uh, uh, the uh, end of the Damascus Spring, uh, early in 2001, marked uh, that point, I think, where cynicism and fatalism seemed to really kind of reappear in a big way inside the, uh, inside the Middle East. It was also the point at which Bashar al-Assad changed strategy with Syria to uh, link up a bit more with what was uh, with the war on terror, with uh, the beginnings of the threats against Iraq, and so on. Of course, the, the Syrian regime was one of the stops for the rendition uh, program, the CIA rendition program. I think it's, it's something we, we have to remember. And I posted today on my Facebook a lovely picture of Bashar al-Assad and his lovely wife meeting the Queen. Just to give you an idea of how, 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 how they were actually br br brought in. So the, the blanket of silence, as we call it, descended once again over Syria. And we thought, even with the revolutions breaking out in Tunisia and in, in, and in Egypt and then across the, the rest of the Arab world, that actually nothing inside of Syria will move. Such was the nature of, of the regime. And so when, uh, 11 months ago, some children in Dara, a city at, uh, on the foothills of the Golan Heights, inspired by the, uh, Egyptian, uh, the Egyptian revolution and the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak, decided to write the people demand the fall of the regime on their school walls. I think there were seven or eight of them. They wrote these up, as the way children do. Over the next few days, they were all arrested, beaten, and humiliated in front of their parents. Uh, this created huge anger inside of Dara, in which the neighbors then came out to protest why are you attacking our children? All they did was write a few slogans they heard on Al Jazeera. And this was, if you like, the spark. The, the, the slogans that then began to emerge were slogans calling on Bashar al-Assad, who everyone had a certain amount of sympathy with, to implement the reforms. The people demand the implementation of reforms was what the slogans were. And as the regime reacted with, ex with uh, increasing levels of brutality, beginning to gun down demonstrations, attacking the mosque inside of Daraa, beginning to disappear people again. People started then chanting, are these your reforms, Bashar? Are these, is this what you meant by reforms? And you can see the anger then beginning to swell and move. This anger uh, was very much on the periphery of, the, of, 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 of Syria. Daraa is a very small town in the south. And, and this uh, periphery, this uh, spread to the other peripheral areas. Uh, very much in the countryside, in the north, amongst the farmers and the peasants and so on. This began to shift and move very quickly. The centers, the real centers, if you like, of Syrian society, both Damascus and Aleppo, were silent up to this point. The, uh, uh, the demonstrations then began to, to create, if you like, and the repression then began to create the conditions for uh, other cities and other neighborhoods to come out, usually in protest against the repression happening somewhere else. And so we began to see inside of areas like, inside of cities like Hamma and also in Homs and Idlib and all these places, small demonstrations beginning in which people, young people as a whole march through the streets, chanting their support for either Dara or Hamma or depending which area was under attack at that particular point. The, uh, the, the, the shift then from the people demand the implementation of reforms to the slogan very quick that, that emerged soon afterwards, the people demand the execution of the, pre of the president, actually showed that there was no room for reforms inside of Syria and that the Syrian state, the hard core of the Syrian state, was not going to let go anyway whatsoever. And so you had, if you like, then the cycle of demonstrations, 
shootings, funerals, the funerals turn into demonstrations, security forces fire on the funerals, the people are buried the next day and you have another, uh, another demonstration if you like. The cycle of, of, of funerals, demonstrations and murder that began to really drive the, 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 uh, the, drive the revolution forward. This became very quickly a very popular revolution. It turned very quickly into a popular uprising and this popular uprising then began to uh, in a real way threatened the very foundation of the Syrian regime. People were now no longer interested in reform. Reform wasn't going to come. What they wanted now was complete revolution. And this, at this point, really, you, you began to see the emergence of a, almost like an organic leadership inside of Syria, inside of the opposition. The uh, opposition itself is made up of several parts, and I think it's important that we distinguish uh, between them. There is what they call the local coordinating committees, which emerged out of the demonstrations, which organized the stuff on the ground, the demonstrations, the solidarity actions, and so on. These local coordinating committees are very much, if you like, part of the neighborhoods and grew up as part of the neighborhood. Um, there is then, as the regime became more and more savage and vicious in the repression, sections of the army began to break away. There were mutinies. Uh, usually it took the form of troops sent in to suppress a demonstration or suppress a neighborhood would go and surrender to that neighborhood and, and, and turn their guns, if you like, on the people who sent them. And this was the beginnings of an armed, well, you know, what people now call the Free Syrian Army, but shouldn't think of it as an army, rather than as a whole series of disparate groups uh, emerging that attempted to provide some kind of protection to, uh, for, for the demonstrations. And the relationship between what we can generally call the Free Syrian Army and the local coordinating committee is one very much on the ground. And it is, if you like, inside of that that, 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 that we can call the real leadership of the revolution, the real heart of the revolution. There is another organization that appeared in the summer. This was sponsored mainly by the West, by, how can I put it, unfriendly Arab regimes, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Saudis, the Qataris, and so on, uh, that tried to form or create a leadership in exile, which would work with the West and model itself on the, on the Libyan Transitional National Council, called the Syrian National Council. This is not the leadership of the revolution. This is a gathering of exiles, an attempt, if you like, by the West to impose a certain amount of control over the revolution. But you have to understand that there's very little real influence the Syrian National Council has over the, 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 the revolutionary leadership on the ground. And the thing about the Syrian National Council, you should also know, is that inside of it, are also former members of the regime who have blood on their hands. Specifically, Hafez al-Assad's brother, or Bashar's uncle, who was responsible for the massacre of some 38,000 people in Hamma in 1982. He is, if you like, now an acceptable exile and therefore enclosed inside the Syrian National Council. And the people will point to the Syrian National Council and say, this is a Western plot. This shows that the Syrian revolution is not a real revolution. That's something cooked up in the West. And we have to say that, yes, the Syrian National Council does not represent the revolution. It represents an attempt by outside forces to control it. But it, all the way through since its formation in the summer, it has been almost, uh, 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 how can I put it, almost hysterical in its attempt to cow and, and coerce the local coordinating committee, the lo local coordinating uh, committees and elements of the Free Syrian Army under its control. This was a huge moral pressure they, 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 they tried to put, put, put on him. Now there is a problem with the opposition and it's a problem that emerges I think out of the condition of Syrian society and it is one reflected to a certain extent in our experience in Lebanon, building in Lebanon and emerging if you like out of the darkness of the civil war inside of Lebanon which was you, if you understand that you grow up in a, in a region where the level of rhetoric is high, where the person who's throwing you in prison says they're part of a socialist regime, where they shoot you and say it's on behalf of the Palestinians and so on. So if you like, the level of rhetoric is so high that, the, that there was uh, a general hostility to anything that sounded political. So inside the local coordinating committees, there was a very strong, uh, very strong anti-political atmosphere. So yes, it's about the detail of organizing demonstrations. Yes, it's about the detail of, of this neighborhood and supporting that neighborhood and so on. But any level of political discussion about strategy, about the aims of the revolution, beyond simply getting with the regime, was something that was shunned. This actually meant that, that at the beginning of the, of, 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 of the revolution, there was a general accepted strategy, which was we, the neighborhoods will go into, or, or, you know, will, will come out in demonstrations, will persuade the mainly Sunni merchant class inside of Damascus 
and the bourgeoisie inside of Aleppo to switch sides, turn on the regime, finish, everything is done. And of course, this didn't happen. The, uh, ele the, the elements of the bourgeoisie and the ruling class inside of Syria, even those not inside specifically the high levels of the regime, were more scared of the revolution than below than they were of the regime from above. So actually, the strategy of simply looking towards uh, the merchant bourgeoisie and so on, the shopkeepers uh, and, 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 uh, and the rich elements inside Syrian society was one that failed. If we look at what happened in Egypt, we see the development of not only the revolutionary forces over the last 10 years, but actually quite hard political discussions between the left and the Muslim Brotherhood, the Arab nationalists. Constantly, this was taking place. Also inside of Egypt, you saw the development of the working class movement before the revolution, the independent trade unions, strike movements, street movements, and so on. This was absent inside of Syria. So the, the Syrian revolution had to go, if you like, to you know, paraphrase an advert, from zero to 60 in under seven seconds. It had to go very, very quickly between sort of no, no politics, extreme repression, no real sense of organization to one that had to organize extraordinarily quickly. And it is, if you like, this failure, this political failure, uh, this hostility, I think, towards politics early on that actually hampered and hobbled the, 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 local, uh, the, local, coordinating, uh, the local coordinating committees. And of course, when you look to sections of the bourgeoisie to come over to your side, then it fits very nicely in with the idea that this bourgeoisie will also somehow fit in the Syrian National Council, begin to, do, um, um, begin to do the bidding of the West and so on. Actually, to look at the Egyptian model, we have to understand there were two important elements to the Egyptian revolution, what made it successful. The first one was the insurrectionary mass demonstrations. Insurrectionary mass demonstrations, a little bit like mass demonstrations we have here, but at the end of it, instead of having a rally, you set fire to the interior ministry. This is a, if you like, the uh, insurrectionary mass demonstration. Very important, because these insurrectionary mass demonstrations have to break the fear on the street, but actually shift that fear from the population into the security services. So you saw in Egypt, the Tahrir Square, the huge, you know, five, six day long battles that took place between the street and the security forces in which the street was able to break the hold of the security forces. That was one side of it. A second side, inside of the Egyptian revolution, was then the development of the strike movement. And I remember it very clearly, uh, you, know, you know, in the Arab world now, everybody says, you know, you name a Friday, Friday for the martyrs, Friday for the continuation of the revolution, and so on. Uh, Hosni Mubarak at the time struck with a great idea in which he said, Monday will be the Monday of returning to normalcy. <laughs> that's, that's what he called it. And of course, he called everyone back into work. The people who weren't involved in the street demonstrations came to work and said, what the hell are we doing here? And everyone went on strike. And so then you, then you had the, the rolling strike wave that then panicked sections of the regime and they dumped Hosni Mubarak. This is, if you like, very crude, that explanation of the events inside of, uh, inside of the Egyptian revolution. This didn't, play, didn't take place inside of Syria. The mass factories, the cement works and, and so on, outside Homs and Hamma and all these places, were not called out in strike. Uh, working class people were involved in the demonstrations, but not collectively as they were in Egypt. So if you like, the strike movement was uh, didn't appear inside of Syria and wasn't seen as being a critical part of the, of, of, of the insurrection as it was in Egypt. And I remember at, at the time having this worry that people would draw the long, wrong lessons from Egypt, simply see it as having a fight with the police and not understanding that there's that other crucial element of working class organisation, what it brings with it, the strike movement, especially when the strike movement went into the military factories. This, this was shunned, if you like, inside of Syria and was, and, uh, 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 and was turned away. So at the very beginning, if you like, of the Syrian revolution, there was this absence of politics. And, and I don't mean this to be an insult to the Syrians. I think you know, it's extraordinarily uh, 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 very understandable, uh, very understandable the position. The repression then, and the way in which the repression uh, be began to develop, then uh, forced, if you like, the Syrians inside, uh, you know, the Sy Syrian revolutionaries to begin to think in a serious way about how they're going to crack Damascus and Aleppo. And when you talk about Aleppo, I think you have to understand it's not simply the biggest Syria, uh, the biggest city in Syria. It's the biggest Syria. It's the biggest city in the whole region, in the whole, including Lebanon and Israel and so on. It's a massive city, a huge industrial city. And it began then. The small demonstrations began inside Aleppo amongst the students. And I think this is then you began to see, if you like, the calls from Hamma and Homs towards Aleppo were calls for them to begin to go out on strike and so on. And unfortunately, the timing was not uh, in, in, in their, in their favour. We now have big strikes inside of Aleppo, starting in the hospitals amongst students, and over the last few days have spread towards the industrial district and so on. But 
Uh, it happened, if you like, slightly too late because at the same time as this was going on, they were sending in the tanks to Homs and Hama and Idlib and Dara and all the rest of the and all the rest of the places. Um, and so, if, if you like, the, the 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 revolution then has to develop and find ways of developing politically, in a in, in a sense, very very quickly, and to attempt to learn the lessons uh, before. There is a, another element of this which is very important, and people talk about it a lot. But actually, when we are, you know, in Britain, and we look and we say why you shouldn't have Western intervention, why the call for Western military intervention is wrong, because for us, it strengthens our regimes here, it strengthens imperialism, and we know that they might, you know, the way, the way they went to Libya actually is probably a precursor for them going into another country. So we understand the dangers of this. Actually, it was very, uh, it, it had a very uh, dangerous and... Uh, 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 how can we regressive uh, um, uh, 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 effect inside of Syria because people then began to believe the idea that the Western military mention was going to come and began to look less towards their own power and more towards the idea that there was going to be some kind of savior in the, in the shape of French warplanes or American warplanes and so on and, and, to, and telling people at the time not to expect this, this is not going to happen, this is not Libya and so on was actually quite a difficult thing to do and I think when the uh, UN resolution was blocked by Russia and, 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 and China, you got the sense in which these illusions in the West disappeared completely. And people began to then look again at what they were going to, uh, how they were going to um, uh, take, the movement, uh, take the movement forward. <coughs> the regime itself, I think, there is an element of it which we, which we have to talk about. And it's quite difficult because there is, a, if, if you like, this tendency, you know, we, we all do it that any kind of regime that finds that any kind of country that finds itself not only recently under the, the, the danger of Western intervention, but for the last 40 or 50 years facing constant uh, threats of well, Western intervention, is that actually we have to do two things. The first thing, of course, is we support any country against foreign intervention, Syria or any other country. It, it, it makes no difference. The regime inside of Syria has had to try and, and do a balancing act between uh, it's the th real threats that's coming from the outside and the threats that's coming from within. I'll start with the threats that are coming outside. You see, when people talk about uh, Libya, what we have to remember is that the distance between Libya and Israel uh, is vast. And actually between Libya and Israel are 82 million Egyptians. So, you know, you're, you know, you're no real danger of being at attacked by the Israelis. The distance between Damascus and the uh, Israeli army is 50 miles because they're camped in the Golan Heights, very, very close to uh, uh, very, very close to Damascus. Actually, surrounding Syria are extraordinarily hostile forces. Not only the Arab, uh, the 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 the, the, uh, the, the Arab, uh, uh, the, the Gulf states, and all that they represent, the, uh, the, the reaction that they represent, but also inside of Lebanon, where the Americans have been attempting to undermine the resistance in Hezbollah and the Palestinians, and so on. So actually, the regime has uh, has has put itself uh, at the heart of supporting important resistance organizations. And this, of course, is absolutely true. Without Syria, Hezbollah would not have had the weapons in order to defeat the Israelis in 2006. Actually, without the Syrian people, the Hezbollah would not have been able to succeed in 2006. I was in Lebanon in 2006 when the Israelis invaded. Uh, actually, I, I, I came a little bit later. I was in Syria uh, uh, at the time, and Syria was full, especially places like Homs and Hama, of Lebanese from the south who were escaping the Israeli bombs, sleeping <coughs> in Syrian homes, and so on. So this is a very important uh, a, a element. Without Syrian regime, Hamas would have been very isolated very, very quickly, and so on. So yes, the Syrian regime was quite important in uh, uh, backing the resistance organisations, and this is not our criticism of it. But it also played a second role, which was it was attempting constantly, especially half the Assad, to try and cut a deal with imperialism and the West. So when uh, uh, Sadat, who was the uh, uh, Egyptian president in the 1970s, uh, uh, made a deal with Israel, uh, the Camp David Accords and so on, make, making the peace, on the same, on a parallel track, half the Assad was attempting to do the same. For Hafs al-Assad, how was he going to negotiate the return of the Golan Heights? How he did this was by showing, or attempting to show, the, 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 uh, the, the US and the West specifically, that he can keep control over the resistance organization. So in 1976, in the middle of the Lebanese revolution, in which we had the Palestinians on the left and so on, thank you, uh, the Palestinians on the left 
uh, 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 in a real revolution, 20 years in the making, uh, Hafs al-Assad sent on the eve of victory of the revolution, Hafs al-Assad sent in the troops to crush the Palestinians and the Lebanese left. There was the massacre, if you like, of the left at that time. From 1976 through to 1986, 87, 88, the main task of the Syrian army inside of Lebanon was this repression. And I was looking at footage today of 1983 in Tripoli, the northern city of Tripoli, where uh, the PLO having escaped, uh, well, many of them having escaped the Israeli onslaught on Beirut, the massacre in Sabra and Shatila, the siege of Beirut, then set up in the north of Lebanon, suddenly found themselves facing another, uh, 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 another offensive, this time by the Syrian army. So uh, Arafat's second exit, if you like, the PLO's second exit from Lebanon was not at the hands of the Israelis, but at the hands of the Assad regime. In fact, when uh, Assad sent, sent in the troops to crush the Palestinians in the north of Lebanon, after that, they also went through and massacred all the communists and the leftists inside of the city. And this was very important because this was the heartland of the communist movement in Lebanon and the dock workers of the MENA and, 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 and so on. It was an absolutely horrible, horrible time. At the same time he was doing this, he also sent in his militias in what's called, what is now known as the Battle of the Camps, the Siege of the Camps, which is those recovering from the massacre in Sabra and Shatila suddenly found themselves under siege again, this time again by Syria and its, and, 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 and its proxies. The Palestinians managed to hold out, by the way, for two years. It then launched its allies in the Amal movement against the PLO and the Palestinian resistance inside the south, in which out of this emerged Hezbollah. It was Hezbollah emerged out of a rebellion against Syrian rule inside of Lebanon. How horrible it is to see Hassan Nasrallah now telling everyone they have to support the regime. Really, 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 really hard. So we have to understand that there is, if you like, not simply the Syrian regime supported the resistance organisation, they also attempted to take control of them. And in so doing, uh, crushed any kind of real movement, any kind of resistance uh, from, 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 from below. And today we heard that uh, one of the kind of important commanders something called the Palestinian Liberation Army, which is the official army of the PLO, was assassinated for criticizing the regime. He was buried today inside of Syria. And the camps inside of Syria, the Palestinian camps inside of Syria, exploded in rage, demanding, again, the fall of the regime, the execution of the president. So the, 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 if, if, you, if you like, this dual role of the Syrian regime means that actually we have to understand it as much more complex than simply, here's Hassan Mubarak, He's a friend of the Americans. Get rid of Hosni Mubarak. Thank you very much. Everything's fine. Actually, it's much more complex than that inside of Syria. And we had, if you like, the resistance organizations, Hamas and Hezbollah, the important resistance organizations, parting ways of the last, uh, of the last few weeks. Hassan Nasrallah, who people talk about being one of the kind of primary strategists, if you like, the most important strategists of the, uh, of, of, of the Arab resistance for you know, generations, the man who Miss, you know, who humiliated Israel in 2006, appearing on television a week ago to say, I just phoned some friends in Homs, people, and they said to me, oh, don't worry about it, nothing's going on. What the hell are you talking about? There's nothing going on in Homs. Everybody has to support the regime. The regime is part of the resistance and so on. And if you go into South Beirut, which I did over the summer, it was quite interesting. There was a slogan on the wall. This is the Shia areas of South Beirut. It said, victory to the revolution in Bahrain, which is acceptable, for Hezbollah, because Bahrain is overwhelmingly Shia population against a, a, a US-dominated uh, uh, Sunni ruling class, but the opposite inside of Syria. And so you, you expect to see the slogan, victory to revolution in Bahrain, but underneath it was also written victory to revolution in Syria. And actually you begin to see the fissure between the old, now we can call them, the old resistance organizations and the people on the ground. You see this inside of Hezbollah, this huge anger that is beginning to build up inside of the areas over the position which Hezbollah is taking to support the regime, but you really see it in a big style, in a big way, in the Communist Party and the left inside of, uh, inside of Lebanon and Syria, where you have, as a rule, the leadership of these organizations demanding everyone support the Syrian regime, but actually the membership <coughs> demanding everyone support the resistance. There is a massive realignment taking place inside of, uh, inside of, uh, inside of Syria. By supporting the regime, Hassan Nasrallah, I think, has cut the throat of the resistance in movement in Lebanon. He has weakened it massively and has made a huge, stupid, strategic error. And uh, I won't say this in Lebanon because you get into trouble. <laughs> but, I will, but I can say it here. Oh, shit, that's on camera. <laughs> but, you know, I, 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 absolutely, watching this man go from hero to zero in such a short, in such a short time isn't something that is nice because he has such... He has such respect 
in, uh, amongst ordinary Syrians and amongst ordinary Lebanese, and this has disappeared. I think it was one Egyptian comrade came to me and said, not one bullet, not one rocket is going to go from the Syrian people to the resistance in the south. And I think this is you know, a statement of fact now, but it's also an extreme weakening. So by allying yourself with the regime and not with the revolutions, the resistance in the south has, uh, has, has made its future impossible. In contrast, Hamas movement broke with the regime a couple of weeks ago. They withdrew all their people, and Haniya, who's the leader of Hamas, had a rally in Gaza last week in which he called for uh, the victory of the popular revolution and support of the Syrian people. And you can see, actually, the way in which this is, uh, uh, that, that, that there was, people talk about Hezbollah having no choice. Actually, there was a choice. There is a choice. Uh, you, 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 can, you can take on it. I, mean, I've been, I was given five minutes, ten minutes ago, so I'll try and sum up in three minutes uh, and make it six minutes. There is, what future of the Syrian regime? If you were asking me this in the morning, I, you would have got probably the, the blackest answer possible that, you know, you just felt absolutely, it felt horrible. You felt there was no future left. You felt that this was a revolution which could not survive. Uh, and the repression and so on, and the level of repression is now taking place. The, you know, we, 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 we've lost our comrades over the last few weeks. Uh, the, the last one was picked up last week, and we haven't heard it from her since. And you just feel this kind of, that, that things are going so much against us. And if you just look at it in those times, of course, that's true. It's very depressing. It can be very, very, very depressing. But actually, you have to look at it not simply in isolation. You have to look at it as actually part of the wider uh, revolutions that are taking place in the Arab world. And there is something, I think, very heartening about the anniversary of the Egyptian revolution, 25th of January, where the main flag going through Tahrir Square was the Syrian flag of revolution. And actually, there's no question, I think, on the ground of the people making the revolutions in the Arab world that the Syrian, that's a serious part of it. And if you're going to have a revolution, even one that's struggling, you might as well have one when Egypt is also in revolution. I think this is probably, you know, uh, very, uh, uh, very, very, very important. Uh, very, very important. I believe, I believe that uh, it's going to be an extraordinarily difficult period. I think that the level of repression is going to be very, very harsh. But I also think that there is an awakening now that's taken place. But it's also very difficult to stick back in, uh, to, to, put back in, to put back in the box. But even then, if we look simply at the revolutions in the Arab world, we'll also miss, I think, the bigger picture. And actually, uh, even though I say it, I hate the term, the, the, you know, the Arab revolutions. We shouldn't think of it in those terms. We have to think of it as a global revolution taking place inside the Arab world. It has its own peculiarities and its own culture and its own language and its own accent. But actually, if you're sitting in, uh, in Cairo and you watch the news of the riots in Greece and the you know, attempts to storm the parliament, you don't sit there and go, mm, aren't the Greeks funny? I wonder what they're up to. Actually, people understand that it's part of something much bigger and much wider. And when we talk about the language of revolution, Actually, and we talk about the revolution having an Egyptian accent, that, that it doesn't, you know, doesn't need a visa to cross the borders. It actually, these, these revolution, this revolutionary spirit is passing uh, across from border to border. And the way in which the movement inside, the revolutions inside the Arab world are rallying behind the Syrian revolution, I think is really important. But I also think we're beginning to see the development politically inside of Syria, in which can begin then to set out a strategy that relies neither on the West nor on the bourgeoisie of Damascus and Aleppo begins to look inside and, 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 and that power. And when people talk about the, the, uh, Syria, you know, we have a joke in Lebanon, it goes like this, the Egyptians have Mahal al Kubra, you know, the huge textile mill, the center of the revolution in Egypt, we have Syria. You know, because when you look at Syria, it's huge working class, huge peasantry, huge uh, 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 and very, very vibrant society at the moment. I believe that even though it, it, it's a setback, at the moment, that actually this process of beginning to set out a new strategy, development of this new strategy that looks to its own power and not to be rescued, I think is probably the best we can take out. Thank you. I just want to start with, with the question of sectarianism, um, because it's quite an important one. Uh, just, to, just to give you a sense of the, the, the region itself, the Bilad al-Sham, the, the, the countries of, of Sham that are now split up, that, that region, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Palestine, uh, southern Turkey, which was handed over to Turkey. By, by French imperialism. All, all, all that region is a mixture of different religious groupings and so on. So inside of Lebanon, we know that there's you know, 19 different religious uh, sects, uh, 20 if you include the atheists. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, inside of Syria, this is also reflected. So you have, if you like, lots of history involved in it. So the vast majority of you know, Homs and, and Hama and, the, and these places that are overwhelmingly Sunni uh, in, in, in 
in composition, and the regime itself, the top echelons of the regime, are drawn from the Alawi uh, community that are close to the Shia. Um, and the sectarianism, we have to understand, is the secret of the survivability of these regimes, both in Lebanon and inside of Syria. And what was really interesting was seeing the beginning of the revolution, actually you still hear it now, the chant emerging, which is the Syrian people are one, 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 we are united people, that actually it was not a sectarian uprising. It wasn't simply to, as they say, push the Alawis back into the mountains because the Alawis come from a very, uh, oppre- historically very oppressed and repressed section of Syrian society. It was, I haven't got time to go into it, but it was from this community that the top echelons of the Ba'athist party emerged and took control and used sectarianism as a tool of rule inside of Lebanon and also inside of Syria. And the, uh, the, the, the deal, if you like, between uh, the uh, Alawi, uh, you know, the, 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 the top elements of the regime and what they call the Sunni bourgeoisie, uh, the, the merchant classes and so on, was one, an alliance of convenience, if you like. Um, but below, um, on the ground, the Alawis are as poor and pissed off as the rest of Syrian society. And then you see the way sectarianism is used. And you know, I, I, grew, I grew up in Lebanon. I think anyone who's grown up in these kind of societies, you, you see exactly how it works. And I remember when the Lebanese civil war, well, the revolution, really, I should say, broke out in 1973 to 1975, in my neighborhood, the way in which they turned the Christians against the Muslims, which they turned this popular uprising into a sectarian fire. It was really simple. You simply went and you killed, and I remember it in my neighborhood, uh, the, 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 the sectarian militia simply went and murdered every, every Muslim in our neighborhood. Uh, we saw this, it was a horrific thing to see. And afterwards, even though we were disgusted by what we saw, we feared more the reaction of the Muslims coming into our, and taking it out on us that we then looked towards the, the very people who put us in this position to defend us. And you saw this in Homs over the last so a month, month and a half, more and more kidnappings of people from Sunni areas, cutting their throats, dumping their bodies in Alawi neighborhoods. Even though this was widespread uh, uh, upset and anger at the regime, actually the way they use sectarianism is so vicious and so nasty that for many Alawis now, they feel they have no choice at the moment, they have no choice but to back to the regime. This is, if you like, the way sectarianism, the, the way sectarianism works. And, and uh, one of the things you have to say, you know, um, you grow up in Lebanon, you go through many, many dark moments, I'll tell you that. But, the, uh, but this sectarianism can over, overcome. Whenever there is a mass movement from below, you really pushes it, you really push it, you, uh, it, it, it really put, uh, pushes it back. So there is an attempt to turn this into a sectarian war and therefore split the poor Alawis away from the poor Sunnis and the poor Christians and so on. Whether it succeeds or not, I can't tell you. I don't think it will succeed you know, in, in the end. But it is, it is, it is, a, it is a big danger. But you, you hear uh, so many reports in which the, they're, they're promoting uh, people close to the Assad family, uh, the villagers and so on, into higher levels inside the army, displacing the, uh, the, the real officers, if you like, and these, these officers, even though they're colonels and generals, having to take orders from captains uh, because the captain is an Alawi. And so you see the sectarian, the way sectarianism works. And of course, the thing is, is that if the Syrian people were stupid, they'd get away with it. But I don't, the Syrian people aren't stupid at all. And people understand, especially the experience in Lebanon and the experience in Iraq, understand what has taken place. And I think they're fighting, uh, they're very much uh, fighting against it. Uh, just, just to say um, that uh, the, the movement in Lebanon, which was inspired very much by the Arab revolutions, the first time since I was young, 1973, there were demonstrations inside of Christian areas calling for solidarity with Muslims. This is after 30, 40, 100,000 people had died in the sectarian civil war. So the idea that people simply accept the sectarianism, of course, is, is, is untrue. It is imposed on you. This is the thing we have to say. And it is this general revolt from below that, that, that can uh, undo it. And then the question of Israel, how Israel feels. You see, the thing is, is that I think there's, a, there's the Israel of pre-1982, pre-invasion of Lebanon and Israel now. Israel and pre-1982 Lebanon thought they can simply meddle inside of Lebanon, invade, put their proxies in, and so on. They destroyed the resistance in the south, the Palestinian resistance, and ended up with Hezbollah. And actually, I think they understand very clearly that what will emerge inside of Syria will not necessarily be a very happy deal for the Israelis. Let's put it this way. The revolution started in Dara. Where is Dara? It is, Dara is the foothills of the Golan Heights. Who is in Dara? The refugees thrown out by the Israelis from 1967. So actually, the slogan, one of the slogans you heard in Dara was the shouting at the, uh, at the Syrian troops 
uh, heroes of repression, cows of the Golan. In other words, you're, you're very, very quick to shoot your own people, but very, very scared to throw, to, 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 to shoot at the Israelis. There's something else I think we should say about the Israelis. I'll, I'll try and make this as short as possible, which is this. In, uh, before making this peace deal with Israel, something like 29% of the Israeli gross domestic product, however that is measured, went towards military. Why? Because if you look south, and there's something like 80 million angry Egyptians. There's only a few Israelis in, in proportion to the, the Egyptians. So you think we have to have as much possible to face the danger of the Egyptians. When they made peace with Egypt, first in 78 and then again in 82, they simply shifted their army from the south to the north. So 78, the first deal, was the first invasion of Lebanon. 82, the second deal, the second invasion of Lebanon. Actually, they turned their whole army to attack Lebanon and Syria in the north. There's something the Israelis learned. They failed. Even though Israel was neutralized, they failed to suppress Lebanon and to su su suppress Israel. So when Hosni Mubarak fell, you can read in Haaretz, which was one of the Israeli newspapers, I a beautiful, most beautiful, I don't know which Israeli journalist coined it, but I thought it summed it up completely. I think it was a day two or day three after Hosni Mubarak fell, it said, we are now in strategic distress. So I think it's a lovely way <laughs> of putting it, that actually the Israelis are in complete panic because they know <coughs> that if the Syrian regime falls, even though they're hostile to the Syrian regime, I'll tell you what, that border between Syria and Israel has been quiet as anything. Actually, the Israelis are very panicky about what will emerge, especially when they look into the revolution and they see the Muslim Brotherhood, they see you know, the, the same forces that have emerged inside of Egypt, but also inside of the Gaza Strip and so on, and I don't particularly like it. So I think they will much rather this kind of slowly, slowly slow burn that, 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 that Bashar al-Assad had before. I think the Israelis are very scared of what's happening inside of, uh, inside of Syria. But I also think that the Syrian movement is going to throw up a popular resistance to imperialism. I'm not saying it's happening now, but you can really see the direction in which it's going. A return, if you like, to Syria of the 1950s and 1960s, when it was this vibrant place before the repression uh, and the blanket of darkness entered uh, uh, came over it. But just, just then, to, to come to the question of Western intervention, I know you're going to shut me up, so I'm going to try and be <laughs> as quick as I can. Um, which is this. I was at a meeting last night in the East London Mosque called uh, in support of uh, the Syrian revolution. Oh, it was really interesting who was there. Because you look, I recognise everyone on the platform from the anti-war movement. And I saw the the British Muslim Initiative, the uh, um, British Association, uh, MAB, the Muslim Association of Britain, FOSIS, the student organizer, all these groups, the Muslim organizer, all of them stood up and pledged themselves to the Syrian revolution. And you sit and you think, you go, what, you think these people now suddenly forgot what happened in Iraq? No, no, no. And Anas al Tikriti, I think, put it really, really well, which he said, he actually got up and said, I condemn, the, I condemn Iran for supporting the repression inside of Syria, but I will support Iran if it has to fight against the Americans tomorrow. And I think this is a very simple way of understanding it, to actually re realize, understand the nature of imperialism and, and, and what it means and what it can do in, 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 inside of the West. But we also have to understand something else, which is Western imperialism is extraordinarily weak. They lost the war in Iraq. They lost about everything in, 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 in Iraq. They lost Hosni Mubarak, Ben Ali, Saleh. You know, everywhere, all their, their friendly regimes are tumbling or about to tumble. You really get that sense. So actually, the idea that somehow is, uh, the Western imperialism on the front foot is not true inside of inside of this. Actually, I think there are other dangers. There are other dangers, the bigger dangers, if you like, coming from Turkey and what Turkey will do and how it's re re repositioning itself and so on. But I haven't got time uh, to, 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 to to go into that. And people talk about you know the the Western you know the, the Western intervention inside of Libya, and I was amongst those who thought the Libyan revolution was over. But actually, if you follow Libya, which I have to do as part of my punishment, um, is, is, is that a few weeks ago, the revolutionary leadership, the National Transitional Council of Nisrata, an important place, and Benghazi, was deposed by a popular vote inside these cities. Why? Because they begin to see, you know, that actually the revolution is, even though the Western intervention revolution is reigniting itself inside of uh, Libyan society. Far from being a nice, you know, friendly pro-Western regime, there's always a problem, I think, when the, when you know the guy who takes command of the of Tripoli is the guy you rendered a few weeks ago, a few a few years ago. Uh, but you know it, it's a little bit worrying, I think, that this was the man handed over by MI6 to Gaddafi regime. He now controls Tripoli. So you know this idea that everything is going nice for imperialism, of course, is not true. Is not true uh, 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 at all. And then we have to look inside of the revolutions itself and understand this process that is taking place. 
I mean, you know, I said there was this formula I said earlier between the instructional mass demonstrations and the, and the mass strikes. And you look at the various revolutions and you can see elements of it both. I remember standing up, I think, at one meeting and saying, look at Kuwait. Very interesting what's happening in Kuwait. There's no mass demonstrations, but it's a huge wave of strikes. Started with the oil workers, custom workers, teachers, everyone that seemed was on strike in Kuwait, but they didn't have the mass, you know, the, the mass movement on the ground that, that, that you had in Egypt. And you look at Yemen, where you had the huge, you know, they call it the mother of revolutions, a million people, really a million people coming on demonstrations, Friday after Friday, a fantastic, amazing, popular revolution, but no strikes, and the regime able to survive. And, and, and no sooner had I sat down and said this fantastic formula that 10 to 20,000 Kuwaitis then stormed the, 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 the parliament and completely blew my theory, so thank God, completely blew my theory out the window. And if you look inside the revolution in Yemen at the moment, you see that the, what they call the Egyptian process take, taking place. There are mass demonstrations of Air Force, office, uh, Air Force workers, soldiers, uh, personnel, demanding the removal of the, of the commander. So you have huge demonstrations in which sections of the demonstration are in uniform marching and chanting, here we are, here we are, the soldiers of freedom, which I think is a fantastic, I wish the soldiers would, would chant that more <laughs> and, 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 and really mean it. And also inside the, the Yemeni revolution, now they call the uprising against corruption, which is beginning to get rid of the old regime in a much slower pace. So those elements are there all the time, and we can see these inside of, uh, inside of, uh, inside of Egypt in a massive way. They attempted to bring, put soldiers in the Port Authority in Suez yesterday. Today, there's a general strike amongst the port workers of Suez. They're attempting to get rid of revolutionaries from Alexandra University this morning. Now there's mass demonstrations. But actually, this is not over. This is the beginning of the beginning. You really feel these things are, are, are shifting. Yes, I will. Sorry, sorry, that's been a, again trouble with the Greeks. You don't want to get in trouble with the Greeks. Um, um, they'll, set, they'll set that right dog on you. Um, and, and, and so, I, actually, even though it's a really, a really hard day, we have to say that this is the beginning, really, of, of a dramatic change that's taking place inside of Syria. It's, it's, it's really hard. It's a very, very hard day. I know, but you look at the, the general trajectory of it. You look at what was the quiet areas of Aleppo and Damascus, and you actually realize that Assad is now at war with the working class suburbs of Damascus, and they at war with the working class suburbs of, of, of Aleppo. These are the key cities. These are the big cities. So even though they might have crushed Bab al Amr today and over the last, uh, last few weeks and, and today, you look at the, the footage coming out and you see demonstration after demonstration inside of Aleppo and inside of, uh, and inside of, uh, and inside of Damascus. And uh, uh, there was one point last week where you thought it was close, you really felt it being very, very close, in which demonstrations emerged out of the southern suburbs of Damascus and seemed to be heading towards the centre and which then it stopped. So you know that there's going to be that moment in which that insurrectionary mood spreads in, 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 in a real way. And having depressed everyone, I, mean, I now want to end with a Syrian joke, uh, just, to, just, to, just to, cheer you, to cheer you all up. And the reason I'll do this is because it's a bit of confession. It's like, you know, in here they always had Irish jokes, uh, how the Irish are stupid and so on. But in, 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 in Lebanon and Syria, people laugh at the Homsies, the people from Homs, how stupid they are, and so on. And we'll say that no one has these jokes anymore, no one laughs at the Homsies anymore. But I'll, I'll tell you a Syrian joke, um, just to cheer everyone up. A man comes home uh, with a chicken in the bag, and he says to his wife, How's the chicken? And he said, uh, Can you cook the chicken? She goes, oh, I can't. Why? He said, Well, because there's no gas. He said, Okay, well, stick it in the microwave. He said, Oh, I can't. Why? Because there's no electricity. He said, oh, okay, well, we have heater in the living room. We'll cook it slowly over the heater. He said, we can't. There's no diesel for, you know, there's no uh, di di diesel for the, for, for the heater. At which point the chicken jumps out the bag and, ch and shouts, long live Bashar al-Assad. <laughs> <laughs>